Hey guys, welcome to week 14 of Come Follow Me Art Journaling. This week we're not actually doing Come Follow Me Art Journaling. We are actually going to be doing something special for this general conference, especially since we are celebrating the 200th anniversary of the first vision. To everyone who's been following along, thank you so much for coming back. To anyone who's new, make sure you hit that subscribe button and the notification bell. I post a new Come Follow Me art journaling video every single Sunday. I thought that maybe I wouldn't do one this week, but I really wanted to do one because with all of the preparation and all of the study that I've been doing over the past several months, I really felt like this was important and I wanted to add my voice to all the others that are celebrating this time in our church. So I felt like I wanted to do my own little art journaling version of the Sacred Grove. I felt like that was just a really good representation of what I've been studying over the past several months along with everyone else in the church right now and it represents the restoration of the gospel and the priesthood and all of these things that we've been learning about and what we're celebrating with this upcoming general conference. So really quickly, I want to explain what I'm doing here on the art journaling page. And then for this week, I'm actually doing something very different. I've decided that I wanted to interview my husband about his conversion story and what the restoration of the gospel means to him and how that's affected his life. So I'm using watercolors and I'm just going to start off by adding a really light wash over the entire page. Okay, so I start off by doing the wet on wet technique for the background. I just get the entire thing wet and then I'm going to add the color to that. That makes it so that you can get a really nice gradient and there's not going to be any harsh lines in your paint. Then I'm going to put down a second layer where I get the entire thing wet again and I'm going to come back through with some darker colors. So then when I start adding in trees, I'm going to add them in really, really lightly. Those are going to be the furthest ones away and you're going to make them small and skinny to suggest that they're very far away. And then as I add trees coming closer, they're going to just be thicker and a little bit darker and the closest ones are going to be very, very dark. Then I'll just be adding in a lot of foliage, especially to the ground area and at the tops of the trees. You can use brown and green and yellow and that's going to give you a really good variety for that. I also use the back of my brush a lot to scratch in little marks to make like little grass lines. And then I'm just going to go over it with many, many layers until it looks the way that I want it to look. To finish the painting off, I'm going to go back in with a black ballpoint pen and I'm just going to outline the trees and some leaves and then I'm going to go back through with a white gel pen and add some highlights and add some more leaves. I just love that because I'm working in an art journal, I don't have to worry about making this all realistic or anything. I can totally make this my personality and exactly what I want it to be. And I really like the kind of illustrated look that this gives. Okay, so that was kind of my overview on how I did the art. Let me know in the comments below if that was enough of a description or if in future videos I need to go into more depth about how I'm actually doing the art. I'd really appreciate that feedback. And now I'm going to talk to my husband Michael about his conversion story and about how the restoration of the gospel has affected his life and what it has meant for him. All right, so here we are with Michael, and I'm going to talk to him about the restoration and how that's affected his life and his conversion story to the gospel. So, hello, my love. Hi, darling. So I just want to get a really quick background on your life. So tell me about what your life has looked like. Okay. I was born of goodly parents, and they taught me in the gospel and really well in the gospel. We had family home evening every week and we had prayer every night and also in the mornings. And we would always sing together. Everybody, all my brothers and sisters, all five of them went on missions. And then it came time for me to go on a mission. I just didn't turn on my papers. I had them ready and I just, I just couldn't do it. I just fell away. I didn't feel like I deserved it. I left the church, which I moved out of my parents' house and I just kind of floundered about until, until I met you. So what happened during the time that you were inactive? Were you searching for something? What happened is I, when I lost my, my testimony or, or really my ability to believe in what I felt to be the spirit, I was then trying to find purpose in life. I became obsessed with becoming useful to somebody, even whether it was good or bad. I just wanted to make an a mark in the world. Some, that led me to 
really horrible experiences, to be honest. It really gave me insight on who I would, was without the gospel. How was your life without the gospel, and how do you think that growing up in the gospel affected that? Without the gospel, my life was extremely lonely. It was horrible. It was like, I didn't like the sin that I was committing, and I wasn't happy doing it. And so I just ended up hating myself more. But I couldn't give in to being good. But even though I was doing all these horrible things and feeling and just being tossed about deep down inside, I still had a little bit of a testimony that there was a God. So what were some of your turning points in coming back to the gospel? To be honest, there's a lot. I, I, I would say that coming back to the gospel is, is a constant process. I get converted and then I think I'm converted and then I find out that that was not conversion because I just have another experience that is conversion. But mm -hmm. um, to begin with, I would have to say it was just my older brother, who is also the reason why I left in the first place, partially, because he was religious schizophrenic. And I had once thought he was a prophet, and but because he wasn't a prophet and because I thought I felt the Spirit tell me he was going to be, I suddenly felt like I couldn't trust what I thought was the Spirit. And that's what made me leave. But it was actually him who also helped me start going back or having a desire. Um, when I was living on my own, I was locking myself away in a room and just indulging in video games or whatever lonely thing I could do because I hated the world and I hated life. He came to me and said, hey, Mike, I need a place to stay. Can I crash with you? And I was like, yeah, sure, come in. So he came into my room and he slept in a bunk with me. And early in the morning at 6 a.m., he'd wake me up no matter how late I stayed up. He'd wake me up at 6 in the morning forced me to say a prayer and then forced me to read scriptures with him. And <laughs> it drove me insane, but we kept doing it. And and then I started to realize that I really loved the gospel, that the gospel taught about love. It taught about unity and and it brought my brother closer to me at that time when I was really low. And that was one of the turning points, which made me kind of think it was, it just left a seed. And then I had a lot of experiences that both good and bad that just transitioned me to become more ready in um, returning to the gospel. So you told me before that you came across some anti-Mormon literature. Um, tell me about your experience with that. Um, it was right after I had a, a large experience that made me start delving back into religion mm -hmm. um, because I knew there was a God at this point and I was just looking for the truth. Um, and looking into it, I met some some Christians, a Christian group who wanted me to come to their Bible study. When I went there, they would bombard me with all kinds of anti-Mormon literature. And I was just like, guys, I thought this was like a, a Bible study group. I didn't know you were going to like just sit here and rip on like the LDS church. I mean, mm -hmm. and they're like, yeah, but we know that you grew up in the LDS church and we're just wanting to make sure that you never go back there because we're worried about your soul. And I was like, oh, great. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so they started telling me all kinds of things, things that seemed very believable and very, very disturbing. And to be honest, what I learned from all this anti-Mormon literature when I finally went home and really thought about it is I've never seen any anti-Mormon literature that considers all the variables. And you were looking at this from a, a pretty logical perspective, right? I was trying to, because at the time I believed that the most important thing in life was logic because I couldn't trust, I didn't feel that I could trust my own sp spiritual experiences. Mm -hmm. And so I was trying to basically numb myself to any feelings and ignore them and then view this all on a logical perspective. So, yeah. mm -hmm. But uh, um, when, so when I looked at all of this, I just looked it up, I looked up their point of views and then I decided to go and look it up in like the church's point of view. At one point, during this time, I also moved back in with my parents, and I was going to go to college. And so I took some seminary classes in church history, partially because I wanted to see their viewpoint. From there, I listened to a extremely amazing teacher who I don't remember his name at the moment, but he he went on to explain about Joseph Smith's different visions and how they all actually kind of back each other up if you look at it in the right point of view. And if you look at it historically, mm -hmm. he wasn't, they weren't actually contradicting as anti-Mormon literature suggests. The biggest thing that he touched on is that you don't really know what happened back then. Confirmed historical records are, are rare. 
And all this anti-Mormon literature comes from people saying, it's just hearsay, that's all it is. Okay, so you had a teacher that helped you see the logic and decipher between the anti-Mormon literature and the actual history. So did you have any spiritual experiences with that, or was that just much later? It was much later. The spiritual experiences didn't come until I gained a actual spiritual testimony, which didn't happen until actually last year. Okay, so tell me about that. Um, so last year I was just working alone in a van and I had read the scriptures a little bit and I realized that I really didn't have like the full testimony and conviction, uh, that I wanted. So I, I prayed to the Lord and just really wanted that conviction because I thought it would, it would help my children. It would help my family. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to be a better teacher because I, I had been called to be a teacher. And, um, when I knelt down and prayed, I just felt the most powerful feeling of of love and acceptance that I've ever felt in my life. It was so powerful that even I, a person who didn't believe in listening to your feelings, I, I couldn't control it. I, I fell down and I, I was holding extinguishers and stuff and that I was taken apart and I just dropped them, powder went everywhere. I coughed and cried my gut and like, like a baby. <laughs> I just cried and mm -hmm. I just remember so vividly I knew at that moment that Joseph Smith was a prophet, the church was restored, that the Book of Mormon was true. Everything I've learned and everything I went through just made perfect sense at that moment. And I, I, I don't think I will ever forget that now. So that's, that's how I finally received a testimony 